food and, and all these other things that, that come to mind when we think about Christmas. But, but you know, I want to take you uh, this afternoon to what the Christmas message is all about, who the Christmas message is all about. And I've got a few short readings that I want to make from the Bible. If you have a Bible, you can read along. If not, I'll try and make the readings clear. And in each of these readings this afternoon, we're reminded of who, of who the Christmas message is all about. And the first reading we're going to read is back in the Old Testament, and it's in Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah. And these words were written 700 years before the Lord Jesus Christ was going to be born. And it says in Isaiah chapter 9, and verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And there's one little title that we'll read in each of these uh, little uh, statements from Scripture this afternoon. So listen out. We'll read these words again. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Over into the New Testament, into the book of Luke. Luke's one of the gospel writers, so he's relaying the life of the Lord Jesus and Luke and Matthew give us an insight into the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're just going to read a few verses from Luke chapter 1. And read from verse 29 to verse 35. And Mary had been visited by an angel. And it says that when she saw him in verse 29, she was troubled at this saying. And considered what manner of greeting this was. An angel said to her, do not be afraid Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And then reading a, a, a verse in, back in the Gospel of Mark, which is the previous Gospel. And again we're reading in Mark chapter 1. And Mark doesn't give us an insight into the life, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark gives us an insight into the life of the Lord Jesus We'll read an event that takes place when the Lord Jesus Christ is a bit older, perhaps about 30 years of age. And it says in verse 9 of Mark chapter 1, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And over into the Gospel of John, a well-known Bible verse, perhaps one of the most quoted Bible verses of all time, John chapter 3 and verse 16, and anyone who's got any uh, Bible knowledge will be able to quote this verse before we even turn to it in our Bible. John chapter 3 and verse 16 reads these words, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life into the book of Romans and just a short reading in the book of Romans Romans chapter 8 and verse we'll read verse 31 for connection but it's really verse 32 what then shall we say to these things if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And one final reading in the first epistle to John, towards the end of the Bible, 1 John chapter 5, and we'll read verse 11 and verse 12. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And we do know that God blesses his uh, reading of his word this afternoon. Now for those who are paying any attention to what we were reading there, there was one little title 
that was given to the person that we're wanting to talk about this afternoon, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was the little title, Son, Son. In each of those readings, we were reminded in Isaiah chapter 9, we were reminded 700 years before the Lord Jesus Christ would be born, Isaiah could pen words that he had no idea what they meant, and he could say, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And in Luke chapter 1, the angel comes to Mary and it reminds Mary that she's going to give birth to a child. And that child is going to be given the title Son of God. And in these two uh, little readings from the Bible, I just want to think briefly about the promise of a son. The promise of a son. And then in, in Mark chapter 1, we're introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ as an older man. It's 30 years of age potentially, just before he's about to start his public ministry and his service for God here in the world. And he's baptised by John. And he comes out up out of the waters of baptism. And the heavens are opened and a declaration is made from heaven by God. He says, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And there we have not so much the promise of a son, but we've got the pleasure of a son. And in John chapter 3 and 16, that well-quoted verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We've got the pledge of a Son, a pledge of God's love to lost humanity, and that he gave his one and only Son. And then we've got in Romans chapter 8, we've got the reminder of the punishment of a Son, that one whom he did not spare, but he delivered him up for us all. The Christmas story doesn't end at, 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 the, at the crib or at the manger. The Christmas story, God's story of love, doesn't end with a little baby lying in a manger. God's story of love ends with God's blessed son hanging on a cross. A punishment of a son. And then I was thinking in 1 John chapter 5, in verse 11 and 12, we've got the possession of a son. He who has the son has life. Five little things. The promise of a son. We've already reminded you there was none like him, was there? Here was one who was prophesied to come 700 years before his birth. You know, Isaiah, a few chapters earlier to that, would remind us of the very way in which he would be born. It would say he was going to give you a sign, and this will be a sign that the virgin will conceive. And bring forth a son. And you'll call his name Emmanuel. God with us. And the one at the very centre of the Christmas message this afternoon. The one at the very centre of the, the, the Christian message. The, the one at the very centre of the, the, the message that God has for us today in Auchin Lake. Is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That one who was born in a unique way. Born via a virgin's womb. Born the way no other man had ever been born. Nor has any other man been born like it since. The Lord Jesus Christ was absolutely unique in his birth. Born by a virgin. And just as that had been prophesied by Isaiah 700 years previously, that came true. Mary, who had never known a man, brought forth a little child. And she laid him in a manger. She wrapped him in swaddling bands. And she laid him in a manger and that takes us away back beyond even the 700 years that Isaiah eh, reminds us of it takes us away back to the garden of Eden where another prophecy was made concerning this one that was going to come and after men had sinned against God and after men had broken God's law and men had had eh, denied God's authority in their life Remember they had taken of the fruit of the tree that they were commanded not to take and the instruction was given the day in which you eat of it you will surely die. And Adam and Eve, overtaken by the serpent in the garden of Eden, took of the fruit and sin came into the world and a prophecy was made on the back of that that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent and in doing so that his own heel would be bruised. And that is a prophecy about our Lord Jesus Christ who would come a millennia later and fulfil that prophecy when he would defeat Satan and he would defeat sin and he would defeat hell and he would defeat the grave. The Lord Jesus Christ is unique. A son promised. A son promised. And God promises to this world his own son. And the world sometimes gets so caught up in the child that was going to be given. The child that was going to be born, don't they? And we give a little bit of credence to that. 
And we think about the manger story, and we could have read of that this afternoon, but I'm quite sure the majority of us are familiar with that story of Mary taking that little baby in the outside place and wrapping her in the swaddling bands and laying her in a manger. And they give credence, don't they, to the fact that a child was born. But the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ was far more than just a child being born. There's nothing drastically dramatic about a child being born, is it? We've all experienced it. It was the way in which we were brought into this world. We were brought in through birth. And those of us who are uh, privileged enough to be parents have been a part of that. There's nothing totally and utterly different or unique about a child being born. But what was different about this one? This was not merely just a child being born. This was a son that was being given. This was a son that was being promised. And the one at the very centre of the Christian message this afternoon. The one at the very centre of the Christmas message is Jesus, the Son of God. And we need to get our eyes fixed on him this afternoon. We need to turn towards him. He is the one in whom we can find salvation. He is the one in whom we can find hope. He is the one in whom we can find rest. He is the one in whom we can find a relationship with God. It's all in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we don't point you to Jesus Christ at Christmas time, and we don't point you to Jesus Christ at any other time, then we're failing miserably to point you to the only one who's the answer for your need. We have a son that was promised. Promised 700 years before his birth. Yea, promised millennia before his birth. Promised in the months leading up to his birth. As Mary gets that uh, angelic in, uh, instruction, doesn't she? That the, she's going to give birth to a son. And the one that she's going to give birth to is going to be none other. And bear none other than the, the title son of God. Jesus was unique. Jesus was not just a man. I don't know what your ideas of Jesus are this afternoon. I don't know what thoughts you've got about him. Was he just a historical figure? Was he just a good man? Was he just, did he just tell good parables? Did he just have the ability to perform good miracles? Jesus Christ is far more than all of those things. Jesus Christ is none other than the promised son of God. He was God manifest in flesh. And we have a son who was promised and then we think of what pleasure that son brought to God. And we read of those verses in, in Mark chapter 1. That occasion when the Lord Jesus Christ was baptised. And the Lord Jesus Christ comes up out of the waters of the Jordan River where John had baptised him. And the heavens opened. And God looks down from heaven and he says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The pleasure that God found in his son. Do you remember God looked down at this world and God didn't see anything that would bring him pleasure? Oh, there was a day when this world did bring God pleasure. There was a day when the men and women of this world brought God, God pleasure. You remember the creation story that we can read of at the beginning of our Bible in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3. And remember how God brings this whole world into existence. A truth that is denied all across our world today. But nonetheless, it remains true. God brought this world into existence. And God would look down in this world as he created it. And at the end of each day he would say it's good. It's good. It's good. It brought pleasure to God's heart. And then God would make man in his own image. And he would take from the very dust of the ground. And he would form man and he would breathe into man the breath of life. And man would become a living soul. And God would look at that. The very, the very ultimate of his creation. And he would say it's very good. It's very good. And men brought pleasure to God for a brief moment in time before that sin that we've already been reminded of came in. When they were deceived by the serpent. And you remember that Adam and Eve partook of the fruit that they were forbidden to take of and sin came into the world. And because of that sin, men and women were separated from God. And God no longer found pleasure in the, in, in the human race. God no, no longer found his delight in them. And they were separated from him because of their sin. And, and, and for the next uh, few thousand years, men lived, really as it were, separated from God. And God looks down and there's nothing to bring him pleasure in this world. And then God sends his son, his promised son. And that son comes into this world and that son lives a life that no other had lived before him. That son lives a sinless life. That son lives a life where he is in absolute oneness with God 
That son lives a life where there's never a wrong word leaves his lips. There's never a wrong thought in his mind. There's never a wrong motive in his heart. There's never a wrong action that he takes. He lives in absolute communion and union with God. And God looks down at that one and he says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And God analyzes, as it were, the very life of his son here on earth. And he says, He brings me nothing but pleasure. There's nothing in him that offends me. He brings pleasure to me. Think of the pleasure that God got from his son. And not only did God announce that judgment over the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is my beloved son in whom I find all my delight. But you'll remember there were occasions when very men, some of whom were responsible for, for, for subjecting the Lord Jesus Christ to crucifixion. Some of them who were, who were responsible for nailing up to the cross as they looked at him. The very man who was guilty of, of, of condemning him to death. He could analyse the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he could say, I find no fault in this man. I find no fault in this man. And remember, even the man who was responsible for, uh, for leading those Roman soldiers who would ultimately crucify the Lord Jesus Christ, he could say, surely this is a righteous man. Surely this is the Son of God. And remember, even the very thief that hung beside the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, as he looked at the Lord Jesus Christ, he could say, we're here because we deserve to be here. He says, but this man, this man has done nothing amiss. And here, amongst a sinful generation, Amongst a sinful uh, humanity, there lived a man who lived a perfect life and who only and ever brought pleasure to God. And where God's heart had been broken by the sin of men, God looked down into this world and he saw a man, his blessed son, that promised son that had come, and in that one he found pleasure. He found pleasure. And you wonder, you know, what do you do with someone who brings you pleasure? You know, what, what, how, do you re- how do you recompense Someone who, in whom you find all your delight. <clears throat> we read of it in John chapter 3 and 16, don't we? Not quite how we would treat someone that we had uh, found all our delight in. Not quite the experience that we would cause someone that we had, uh, that, that, we, that we loved and who loved us. We're not quite the experience that we would cause them to go through. But, but John chapter 3 and verse 16 tells us what God is going to do with his son. This son that is perfect. This son who is holy. This son who is righteous. And he's going to take that son. And as a pledge of God's love to us, he's going to give that son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The son that he had promised was going to come. The son who brought pleasure to his heart, not only in the time that he was here on earth, but a a son who had brought pleasure to his heart for all eternity past, and because of his love for you and me, God makes a pledge of love that he is going to give his son, his only begotten son. And what is it that causes God to give his son? The verse tells us, doesn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Son, that's the Christmas message this afternoon. That is the gospel, the good news message. That is the Christian message. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For you and for me. You think of the love that God must have had for that perfect son. You think of the love that God must have had in his heart for that son in whom he would find all his delight, in whom he would find all his pleasure. And yet God takes that in one hand. And in another hand, he looks at a fallen, broken humanity that you and I make up with all our rebellion and all our sin and all our brokenness and all our emptiness. And God looks at us and God looks at him. And God makes a decision in his heart that he's going to give his only begotten son for us. That's how much we're loved this afternoon. That's how much God loves you. That God was willing to give the very best that he had. He was going to send that promised son 
at the time and in the way that he said he would send him. He was going to acknowledge to the world the pleasure he found in him and then he was going to take that son as a pledge of his love to you and I and he was going to say, I'm going to prove to them how much I love them. People say, God doesn't love me. People look at the emptiness of their lives. People look at the tragedies that they go through. People look at all the upset and all the horror and I know, I know there is all that by the way. And I know in, a great, in, a, in the greatest sense I've been spared a lot of that. And, but I appreciate for a lot of people life is hard. And life has dealt them some tough blows and people look at that and they say, God doesn't love me. I want to tell you this afternoon, turn your eyes to the Lord Jesus Christ and see him. Because that and he in himself is an evidence of God's love towards you. There were people in the Old Testament and that was their declaration. They said, wherein have you loved us? And people all across the world say that. And perhaps you're sitting in this little hall this afternoon. Or perhaps you're watching online. And perhaps that same question is ringing through your, your ears. Wherein has God loved me? Where is the evidence of God's loved me? Well, here is the evidence. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you. And God demonstrated his love towards you. And that while you were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For you and for me. We're loved. We're loved by God. God sent his son as a pledge of his love towards you and I. To demonstrate to us just how much we're loved. So much that he gave up his only son. And some of us are sons here this afternoon. And some of us have sons. And we would never give them up for anybody, truth be told, would we? We would not give them up for anybody, let alone give them up for our worst enemies. And yet God takes his blessed son, his perfect son, his holy son, and God gives them up for you and I, who are enemies of his, who are sinners, because God loves us. And you're loved. And you'll maybe not take anything else away from this little service this afternoon. You'll maybe not remember the words of the carols that we've sung. You'll maybe not remember my five different points that I've tried to outline for you this afternoon. But take this away. You're loved by God this Christmas. You're loved by God. And God has shown his love towards you. And that he has given his only son. And how did he give him? Oh, I know at this time of year we like to think of the little infant in the manger, don't we? We like to think of the shepherds gathering around about the manger singing their praises. We like to think of that serene, serene little scene as, as Mary and Joseph are there. And, and we like to think of the infant lying in the, little, in the little manger. And we like the nativity story, don't we? But, but the reality is that that's not where God sent his son to. That wasn't what God gave his son up for. He didn't just give him up to be in a manger. We've already reminded you that the Christmas story doesn't end with a baby in a manger. The Christmas story ends up with a man on a cross. And that's where he was going. That's where he was destined for. The Lord Jesus Christ wasn't just destined to lie in a manger. The Lord Jesus Christ was destined to go to a cross. And Romans chapter 8 reminds us of the punishment that his son endured. See, that sin that we've committed, those wrongs that we've performed against God, that distance that we created because of our sin towards God, God needed to deal with our sin. We were reminding ourselves this morning, earlier on, just about how holy God is. And God is of holier eyes than to behold evil. You know, we've got a knack, haven't we, of just kind of trying to push sin to the back of our mind. Or pushing, or, or sweeping sin, as it were, under the carpet. Or just trying to kid on that it doesn't exist. But God is far too holy for that. And God needs to deal with sin. And yes, God loves the sinner, but that doesn't, get, that doesn't negate his need to deal with the problem of sin in itself. And how is, how is God going to deal with sin? God is going to judge it. God is going to punish sin. The full wrath of God is going to be poured out on sin. And God has got an option. Does God pour that wrath out on the, on the people that have committed it? Does God pour that wrath out on you and me? Or does God look at this blessed son, this promised son, this perfect son, this son who ever and only brought pleasure to him, this son who was a pledge of his love to mankind, and he says, I'm going to punish him. I'm going to punish him for their sin. 
And I will deal with sin. And I won't ignore sin. And I won't kid on that people haven't sinned. And I won't dismiss sin. And I won't sweep sin under the carpet. And I won't, I, I won't push it to the back of my mind. He says, I'll deal with sin. And I'll deal with sin by pouring it out on my son. And it says in Romans chapter 8, the, the verses that we read, He who did not spare his son, his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And the punishment of your sin and mine was poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God punished them for your wrongs in order that we might stand before God righteous and forgiven and cleansed. And the little baby in the manger became the man on the cross. And the man on the cross was there bearing the sins of this world and bearing your sins and bearing my sins. That's the wonderful Christmas story. That is the wonderful message of the good news of God. That he, the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, was made sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. And your sins, all your sins, were taken and the punishment for those sins was poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ. The son was punished. For you and I. And what is required of us this afternoon? What's required of us to come into the blessing of that? To come into the good of that? What is required of us this afternoon to experience a, a fresh, a new relationship with God? Knowing that sin no longer it stands between us. Knowing that sin no longer uh, denies us the presence of God. It's faith. It's faith in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. It's about taking that message for ourselves and making it our possession. It's about possessing the Lord Jesus Christ for ourselves. And that's what John writes to these Christians in 1 John chapter 5. He says, and this is the testimony that God has given us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And we need to take the Lord Jesus Christ and we need to make him our own. He needs to become our possession by faith. We need to trust him. Someone once asked the question in the Bible, what must I do to be saved? How do I come into the good of salvation? The answer is this, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Take the Lord Jesus Christ as your own possession. The Lord Jesus Christ has been offered as a gift. You know, what do you do with a gift? You've got two options really with a gift, haven't you? You either accept the gift and you make that gift your own and that gift becomes your possession and, and by right it belongs to you and no one can take that away from you because it's been given to you. Or the other option is that you, you, you reject the gift and you say, I don't want the gift. I don't want anything to do with the gift. And it's the same with God this afternoon. God has extended a gift to you in the person of his son. His own son. God can't give you any more. And he's extending it to you. And he's saying to you, it's before you. And what do you do? The choice is yours this afternoon. God has done all he can. Literally, God has done all he can. God can do no more for you this afternoon. What more do you want God to do than send a promised son? than to take a son who brought him pleasure and to make him a pledge of love to die on a cross for your sins, to punish him for you. What more are you expecting God to do for you this afternoon? God can do no more. God has done everything he possibly can and he sits before you this afternoon, the, the, the life, eternal life in the person of his son and he says you either take it today or you reject it and that is your choice. God will not force you to accept his gift this afternoon. God will not force you into a relationship with him. God presents the saviour. And, and he leaves the choice up to you this afternoon. I wonder are you going to take that gift for yourself? I wonder this Christmas, are you going to take possession of the Lord Jesus Christ and make him yours? And in him, 
have eternal life and have life in all its fullness. It's a gift. The Bible tells us what we truly deserve. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But it says the gift of God is eternal life. And that gift is given, offered to you this afternoon. And it's up to you what you're going to do with that. You're going to accept it. You're going to thank God for the gift of his son. And you're going to thank God that despite who you are and despite what you've done and despite what you deserve, you thank God that he poured this punishment of your sin out on his son. And you take the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour and he becomes your possession. And in possessing him, you possess everything. And you possess eternal life. And it's up to you this afternoon. It's the greatest gift you'll ever be offered. You might be anticipating some good gifts in the the next few days. I don't know. You might have your eye on something really nice that you're hoping somebody's going to give you. I'll tell you, it'll fail into into insignificance. (laughs) Get there. Pale into insignificance against the glorious gift that the Lord Jesus Christ has offered you today. And it's him. It's himself. And it's everything that he can give you. So just remember that this afternoon. You're loved by God. And there's a gift that has been given. I wonder, are you going to possess that this afternoon? Are you going to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour? Are you going to come into the good of his salvation today? So we'll just pray. And then we've got another chorus to sing together.